welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we have the fantastic opportunity to chat with Matt Berger. Matt is a trained botanist with a master's degree in forest pathology from West Virginia University. He currently works as an ecological surveyor for the Great Basin Institute. Now, it would be putting it lightly to say that Matt is obsessed with the conservation of rare plants. He shares this passion through Instagram and YouTube and is encouraging everyone to explore the deep wilderness and document their plant and fungal finds for researchers to later study. All of his free time is absorbed searching for plants, and he even takes years off from work to hike the great trails like the Pacific Crest Trail, CDT, AT, AZT, and others. I'm excited to do a little vicarious hiking deep into the desert and the mountains, searching for and documenting rare and endangered plants, and then see what fungi that we run into along the way. Matt, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Of course. And as we're recording, you're actually out in the middle of the Nevada desert right now. Yep. I'm in the Spring Mountains just a little bit uh, outside of Las Vegas. And I'm assuming this is on the hunt for rare and wild plants. Yeah, actually, this area, there's tons of really, really interesting plants here because the mountain that I'm on is sort of a sky island, so it's surrounded by desert, but then there's bristlecone pine forest and ponderosa pine and aspen and everything up on the mountain. So there's enough moisture in there to let some plants grow at any time you get any kind of island, right? You get a lot of diversity. Yeah, because you have all these different elevation ranges where plants live, especially up really high where it's isolated and the only similar habitats on the next mountain range over on their elevated areas too. So you get a lot of speciation on these. So this mountain here has, I think, at least a dozen endemic plants just right here. Just on that mountain? Yeah. Wow, that's insane. Well, I'm excited to learn more about plants. As I was saying before the show, I don't know a ton about plants. So this will be hugely informative to me. And I know you also find mushrooms while you're out there. So we can talk about that too, what you're learning about that symbiotic relationship. But where I always like to start is with a brief origin story of you, of Matt, you know, a little bit of how you found yourself in love with trees and plants and nature and mushrooms, you know, whether it was something in your family, someone who influenced you, whether it was something through education or just some other synchronicity through your course of your life that brought you here. Uh, how did you become the plantophile that you are now? Well, um, I'm from Ohio. I'm from around Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, my dad has always been really interested in science, kind of in general, not particularly plants or anything, but we go on camping trips a lot as kids. And I was obsessed with the crocodile hunter growing up, so I'd be catching snakes and lizards and things like that. Nice. But I got really interested in insects when I was very young. And so I would collect them. I had all these field guides to identify them. And then I was in Boy Scouts as well. And we go out hiking all around Ohio and Kentucky and Indiana, and I would see all these cool bugs on plants, you know, feeding on them or, you know, like milkweeds, monarchs feed on the leaves. So I collected seeds from the milkweed and from all these other native plants I saw and then tried to grow them to make the insects come to my yard. So <laughs> the plants were really like a workaround to see insects. But then when I started growing them, I got really interested in them. And there were forums online back in the day where you could trade seeds with people all over the, you know, country and People would mail me seeds and I'd mail them seeds from, you know, where I grew in Ohio. And so I have a garden full of all these crazy native prairie plants and all that. A lot of them are still alive, too. It's like over 15 years ago. So that's what really got me interested in the plants. I see that you got your master's in forest pathology. And I'm starting to learn a lot more about biodiversity in general, but also ideas like community ecology and how all the life forms in a certain bio range or a certain area, how they all interact. But what is forest pathology and does it have anything to do with that idea of kind of community ecology? Yeah, it definitely does. So forest pathology is studying the interaction of plants, the forest trees and insects and fungi that interact with them. So for example, I studied a beetle that carried symbiotic fungus in its head 
and then it burrowed into the trunks of trees and would literally plant the fungal spores into holes in the trees what? and then feed on the fungus. So they, they're fungus farming beetles. So the reason that I was really interested in working in forest pathology is you get to work with insects, plants, and fungi. They're all all intertwined. And the beetle that I worked with, it, it was just perfect because I got to play with bugs, I got to play with plants, and I got to play with fungus, growing them in auger dishes and all that. So it was just a really nice way to interact with all the major kingdoms of life, all the macroscopic ones anyway. Yeah, yeah. Now what kind of beetle was that? So it's an ambrosia beetle. It's called Euwelacea validus. I think its common name is the polyphagous shot hole borer. And uh, mm -hmm. it comes from Asia. And they thought that they got here shipping lumber from you know, China or somewhere over there. And then they live in the wood. And then they flew out and escaped. And luckily, they have like a very good preference for a tree of heaven which is a really bad invasive tree in the eastern United States and lush parts of the west. It doesn't really damage living trees. It, it usually only goes for stressed out or dead trees, but it still makes it really easy to find them. You just pick them out. You can find their holes. You chop down the tree. You cut open the wood, and then you'll see the little tunnels in there. And then you can collect the fungus on the edge of the tunnels and grow it on auger. But the easiest way to do it is to collect the beetle and then you pop its head off, it's kind of sad, and then you crush it because it has these specialized pouches in its head that store the fungal spores and maintain them and keep them viable. And then once it goes to a new tree, it regurgitates them out of its head and it infects the little tunnels and then they sit there and farm and raise eggs in these galleries. That is absolutely insane. Fungus farming beetles. I have heard of some different species of ants and some other invertebrates that farm fungi. Uh, and actually, I know there is some research, especially with certain mycorrhizal fungi that may not even have fruiting bodies, that invertebrates like that can be a key part of how they distribute across ecosystems. But to think that this beetle developed a special pouch and it basically evolved with this fungi is absolutely fascinating. Was it any one species of fungi? What's, what's their preference? So... The species that I worked on was actually pretty unusual. It has two symbiotic fungi that it always carries with it. One is a fusarium, which is a little ascomycete with canoe-shaped spores. And then the other one was a raphaelia. It doesn't grow very fast in culture. It's just kind of like a little slimy blob, but it always maintains these two species. So it must be using them for something, but we don't exactly know what. The fusarium seems to be the major food source. Got it. I was wondering if it was for food or if it was some kind of good substrate to lay eggs in or something. Yeah. So the fusarium will infect the wood galleries. They drill little holes in the tree and then the fusarium will grow on the wood in the holes. And then the beetle just walks along and eats the fungus that grows like right on the edge. A really good example of that study of forest pathology, how all these life forms in one area are interacting, working together, evolving together. That's just fascinating stuff. Yeah. So when the beetle came over, so did two of these exotic fungi. So my job for my master's was to study if the fusarium or the raphaelia caused disease on any of the native trees, because mm. it'll attack almost any tree. It doesn't really care. And out in the eastern United States, where I checked, it didn't really damage trees too bad. But down in California, these beetles will go into avocado trees and that fusarium species will cause cankers and can kill avocado trees. So there it's economically important. But in the eastern United States, at least right now, it doesn't seem to be a very big threat to the forests. Yeah, you come after a Californian's avocado fields, and suddenly everyone wants to solve that problem. Yep, that's, that's how you get funding for things like this. <laughs> you just laid out a beautiful example of it. But in general, in your experience, in your research, how important is it to understand fungi when you get into this path of understanding plant communities and understanding forests? To you, how central is an understanding of fungi and seeing that bigger picture? Uh, it's really important. So a lot of plants have symbiotic fungi that grow with them. A lot of the forest trees, especially at the higher elevations here, have symbiotic fungi, mycorrhizal fungi. 
they grow with the roots, things like russulas and lactarius and boletes. And the trees can't live without them or they'll be stunted and they have to be there. They've evolved together. They're dependent on each other at this point. So if you're only paying attention to the above ground tree, it's just not, it's like thinking of a cow without any symbiotic bacteria in its stomach. The cow can exist, but it's going to suffer. It needs more than just the animal. Yeah. I mean, it's this idea that organisms seem to always be collections of colonies of other organisms. And that's why this idea of forest pathology is so interesting to me is you can almost see a forest as its own organism with communities of other organisms that inhabit it, do what they do. Is that something that you ascribe to? Do you see kind of bio ranges or, you know, when you're out hiking, you see these big eco ranges on a mountain or something like that. Do you see that as kind of one organism? Yeah, it's, it's all woven together. All those plants also, if they're flowering plants, depend on something to fertilize them. So you can add insects to the mix usually, or birds if it's pollinated by hummingbirds. Right. So these things don't exist on their own by themselves. They need the whole community to successfully reproduce and exist. And now in your experience in academia, is that well known when you're studying botany or forest pathology is there a lot of crosstalk or overlap between mycology and other studies? Is that pretty well known now that you can't separate these things as much as maybe we did at one time? Yeah, definitely. People are learning more and more about how things are all related. Um, it was just a couple of years ago, I think, that people realized that lichens have a basidiomyce symbiont almost always. And no one ever checked. No one ever knew that. Almost every single lichen species on Earth has the yeast, a basidiomyces yeast symbiont with it. So people are looking for, you know, interactions between microbes, especially now that we have better ways to detect them with molecular technology. So people are looking, you're finding symbionts and leaves of plants, you know, you plate out a leaf and then you get this uh, symbiont that grows in the leaves. So we're learning more and more and more that the world is just completely intertwined with other species. Nothing really exists on its own. Nothing exists on its own. That's definitely what I've been seeing more and more as I speak with people about biodiversity and educate myself, you know, cause I was so into mushrooms and I love foraging and that's kind of my obsession, but inevitably you have to learn about plants and trees. Obviously on the fundamental level of foraging, you need to know what trees you're looking at to find the mushrooms you want, but then you also need to learn about bacteria. You might need to learn about, insects that are actually distributing the spores or certain fungi so you can't get away from how interconnected everything is now plants specifically i'm a big fan of a book called the overstory i don't know if you've read that book but it talks about this idea of plant intelligence and how we're still discovering ways that plants interact most specifically with humans is there any amazing facts or anything you tell us about maybe the evolutionary history of plants in the context of humans, how we may have co-evolved in certain ways together, or are there any specific uh, chemicals or anything like that that interacts with human biology? Because we're talking about some of the interactions between other players, but is there any interaction that plants have with humans on some biological level or maybe an evolutionary level? One thing that I I think is really really interesting is the thought of we have all these domesticated plants you know humans spent 10,000 years getting this plant to grow big and make a lot of food for people but you could also look at it from plants point of view think of wheat wheat is now one of the most successful living plants in the world it grows all over the place and humans do everything for it humans fertilize it humans water it humans weed it humans spray it with chemicals so you could think of wheat as almost domesticating humans because it's going out, living its life, and people are breaking their backs, tearing up the land, you know, manufacturing chemicals just to keep these things alive. I like that, that plants have actually domesticated humans. That's fantastic. Obviously, what you're doing right now is searching for rare plants. You're going out foraging for rare plants. What does the process of plant foraging look like for you? Are there specific biomes 
that you like to focus in on for a certain reason in terms of the plants that are there? You know, what are you searching for and why? Yeah, definitely. Especially in there's a lot of mountains, limestone. And limestone has a very specific chemistry. It's kind of more basic. A lot of plants only grow on carbonate substrates made of limestone or dolomite, things like that. So you can look for, and you can tell, you can see, like I'm looking out the window right now, and I can see gray limestone rocks. And so you can go up there, and you'll find plants there that you can't find on, say, granite or sandstone even if it grows right next to it. You can find a spot where both rocks are, and then you walk over onto the limestone, and you get a whole different set of species. So there's a lot of microhabitats, too, that you can go and search for plants. Cliffs. Cliffs, all, I don't really know why. It's kind of a rarefied habitat. So cliffs are a great place to look for rare, unusual plants. If you look on the north-facing side of a steep cliff, it's shaded for more of the day, so it's cooler. So you can find plants there that would grow either at a higher altitude or at a higher latitude. And sometimes that can mean little relic jewel areas where plants can persist that were there during the ice age that may have been more widespread and now are restricted to this tiny little pocket. And lots of times those plants are rare because the habitat either no longer exists or because it's moved farther north. Right. So you primarily then stick to, it sounds like deserts and mountains. Would you say that's the most expertise you have in terms of examining plants, maybe some of their evolutionary history and searching for them in the wild are kind of those biomes, desert, mountains, and the microclimates in there? Yeah. So I've mainly been focusing on desert mountains down low, kind of low elevation early in the year. And then as plants progress at higher elevations as it gets warmer they'll bloom higher and higher and higher and you can follow them all the way till the tops of the mountains out here into like september and august there'll still be things coming into flower at other times of the year i'll be down in different parts of california or southern california things start blooming really early down in like san diego county mm. and so i'll go down there to anza Borrego desert and you can see lots of things blooming in late january and february so I just kind of follow the seasons wherever the plants are. But yeah, for the most part, I'm really fascinated with desert mountains and high mountains, Sierra Nevada, Klamath Range, anywhere where there's a lot of like exposed bedrock, unusual plants seem to like that. Now, why is that? Is it something about the mineral composition of the bedrock or why do they seem to like those areas? It's a pretty harsh habitat to grow on because right. it's... It doesn't drain very well, so plants there usually grow in cracks, and it's not a super common habitat elsewhere. Like if you're just down in the valley, it's kind of all the same everywhere, but when you mm -hmm. get up onto solid rock, water runs down them in predictable ways. Like every time it rains, the water goes down, falls in the crack, and then the plants can use that. So it may be a harsh climate but it's almost easier to, to know where to look because there's only certain places yes. in that climate where they can grow. Exactly. Yeah. When you find open rock outcrops, you, and you can do it by satellite, and you can do this anywhere. It doesn't have to be in mountains. Anywhere where there's exposed rock where the trees aren't around them, there'll be different plants growing there. So it's actually really fun to just sit there on you know Google Maps and look around on satellite and be like, oh, I can see a rocky outcrop here. And then you drop a little pin and then you find your way over there. And lots of times there'll be unusual things growing in those openings. Well, wow, that's really interesting. Now, can you learn anything about the geographical history of a place? Or do you start to get a picture how certain geographies came together or how climates changed over millennia, that kind of thing? Does any of that go hand in hand with, with the research and search for rare plants? Yeah, definitely. So you can um, look on geologic maps and try and find limestone outcrops. If you're not familiar with what the rock just looks at when you're driving by, and you can be like, oh, okay, limestone grows here. So I know this plant, this plant, this plant will be there or, or could be there versus just picking at random somewhere within the range map if you were looking in the book, say. And it's, it's interesting to try and learn what the formation they're growing on is. I'm not a geologist geologist but i can identify a carbonate rock versus something else and i just know in this general area here 
I think that these are all sediments from like 300 to 500 million years ago, all these limestone outcrops. So they're super, super old. And you can find fossils in them sometimes too. There'll be little corals or brachiopods and things like that. Why do you love rare plants or why do you search these specific biomes for rare plants? What's the, what's the fascination there for you? It's like a treasure hunt. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't really, it's just really exciting to look something up online or in a book and then be like, whoa, almost nobody has seen this plan. Nobody's gone and looked for it. A really good example, about two weeks ago, my girlfriend and I went into the Quinn Canyon range in Southern Nevada, just north of here, a very remote mountain range. And there's a plant there called Lewisia maguiri. It's like a little succulent. It's in the same family as miner's lettuce. Okay. And it hadn't been seen to my knowledge in like a couple decades, I don't think. And it's only ever been known from this tiny little spot in this canyon. And we went up there and we found it and it was blooming. It was super cool. You're like, yeah, we're the first people to see this. And <laughs> who knows how many years actually in flower. And then we came back to where I am now in the spring mountains and went hiking around. And we found the same plant, the same species growing right over here. It had never been seen in this area ever before. And it's just because no one ever looked for it. No one ever thought that it could be here. We just went to the exact same habitat. And sure enough, Annie just happened to see it. And then we, you know, notified some other botanists and they were super stoked. They're like, oh, this is great. And they went into their herbariums and started looking at specimens of Lewisia that had been collected in Southern Nevada. And they all turned out to be this extremely critically endangered species. And they were just misidentified. It's just really exciting to do things like that, to go hunt for things that are rare because they're in need of protection because, you know, they only grow in a tiny spot or people just don't know about them and haven't looked for them. So that was one of the most exciting finds that we've ever had. We, we were absolutely stoked. I don't know. It just brings pleasure to look for them. It's exciting. Um, there's some scientific value to it because now other people can go and look at them or research them. Um, they can extract DNA and see how they're related to other species in that genus or in the family. It's just really rewarding to go look for something. Well, it's the same thing with mushrooms. And that's, I think a lot of people who hunt mushrooms have those exact same feelings. Of, I just want to go out and see what's out there. It's funny because I always ascribed that to mycology being this newer science. So there's less data, less people have gone out to attempt to find mushrooms. So there's still like this vast unknown. And that's really true for mycology. It's amazing to hear that's still the case with plants in some ways. You know, there's yeah. still huge untapped frontiers of discovering plants. I, I always associate that with mushrooms. You know, you go out in the wild and there's this huge unknown universe of life forms in, in kingdom fungi. It's like, well, in the plant kingdom, there are also huge untapped frontiers and it really starts with getting out there to make some of these finds and like you said you're adding to this generational catalog of scientific data that's one thing that always impresses me is the impact that amateur foragers can have or amateur plant or mushroom hunters can have in furthering science is just going out and getting the data now are any of the plants that you look for some kind of unique edible? Are there any uni unique medicinal properties that you look for? Uh, or is that is it more about the search and the exploration of biodiversity for you? Or is there anything about like food or medicine that, that's relevant too? For me, it's mostly just for fun and the scientific recording of the plants so that other people can know where they are. I'll eat like common things that I find, you know, more weedy plants, but I don't really collect anything for medicine, especially if the plant is rare. Mm. Just, you know, you don't want to collect it because there's not many of them to start with. But I mean, you've come across all kinds of other plants and mushrooms and stuff on your hikes. And when I'm hiking around, you know, if I find some morels or some king bullets or something like that, they come with me. <laughs> oh, that's that's what I'm talking about. So you do end up coming across 
fungi while you're out there in oh, yeah. some of these areas? Not so much in the desert region, just because sure. <laughs> it's just too dry. There's a couple desert mushroom species that are pretty interesting, and you'll see them fruiting, like even in low elevations in Death Valley. But I don't think that you can eat them. Like Podaxis, it's like a desert inky cap or shaggy mane or something. If there are areas where there are unique plants, I'm sure you're finding some unique fungi as well. And I was yeah. going to ask that about some of these rare plants you find in desert mountain regions. If you know about any fungal relationships they have, maybe in the vein of like the mycorrhizal relationships you were talking about. I, I don't know if there'll be anything as vivid as a beetle farming fungi in them. But if there are any uh, relationships to fungi that some of these rare plants you're finding have, even in, even in the drier areas. A lot of the plants out here will still get fungal diseases. Um, they'll get rust or smuts and things like that and you can see them growing on the plants out here and i don't honestly know too much about them i can look at them and be right. like, oh there's a rust on this there is a really common one out here in the desert even in the high desert um called puxinia monoica it's the brassica rust and it gets on bokara and Erebus and a couple other kind of like common brassicaceae you know mustard family and it stunts the whole plant and turns it bright yellow and all these little it, it calls it like a pseudo flower because it's bright and it actually smells kind of floral. It like hijacks the plant and then flies and other insects come and land on this fake flower and then they'll fly around and land on another plant and transfer the spores. So there's a pretty neat life cycle going on there. But yeah, like in Nevada where I am right now, it's a series of basin and ranges. Um, so you get deep valleys and then you get huge mountains. Like some of these are, you know, 12,000 feet tall. And on top of those, you'll find your bristlecone pine forest. Your, there'll be firs. And so I would assume that there's, you know, bolites and russulas and all kinds of fungi growing beneath them with the trees. And they are completely isolated from the next range over. Now, I know fungi can kind of spread farther than like a plant or an animal can because of their spores. They can fly in the air. But still, I think that each range you know, is pretty isolated reproductively from any of the other fungi in the other ranges. So I wouldn't be surprised if there were undescribed species of fungi just completely across Nevada at the higher elevations. It's interesting to think of mountains as this unique environ that might have completely different plants and fungi or at least different species. And that whole idea of rusts and smuts and things that our fungi that are pathogenic to plants is something I don't think about. You know, I'm really into mushrooms and I love hearing about how mushrooms tap into plant roots and help plants grow. And I love hearing about all the positive things, but there is this pathogenic relationship. That's something that I think I often discount. Do you run into this pretty frequently? Do you run into that kind of pathogenic relationship? Is it like a plant specific thing or can some of these rusts and smuts attack lots of different plants a lot of them especially rusts are really really host specific a lot of them will only attack one genus or a closely related group um, in a family like the brassica rust that'll get on a couple of different species but they're all pretty closely related species then there's rusts that get on like blackberries and they're pretty specific too and they don't rusts almost never kill the host. They just kind of mess it up because if you're a parasite, killing your host means you die too. So right, I just right. kind of look at them and I'm like, wow, these are really pretty. Because if you look up close, especially through like a hand lens, the little spores are they're bright orange, or bright yellow. They're really beautiful. <laughs> they even smell good in some species. Not that I'd go huffing spores too much. <laughs> um, but I mean, I don't even look at them as like, oh, that's too bad that plants injured. I'm just like, oh, that's, that's freaking cool. <laughs> yeah. And can plants ever recover if they do get rust or something? Do oh, they... yeah. Yeah. It doesn't usually kill them. The brassica one, it, it kind of messes it up pretty bad. But a lot of those species are perennial or biennial and they'll just hopefully come back next year. What do you recommend to want to be plant foragers, people that want to get out and explore, you know, the kingdom of plants alongside the kingdom of mushrooms what are some good resources whether it be online books that kind of thing how can we uh how can we all expand our knowledge on this so i'd say probably the best one is iNaturalist. 
which you can use on your phone and on the computer. And so when you're just out, say you're looking for mushrooms and you see a cool plant and you're not sure what it is, you can take a picture of it with your phone. And then most phones today are geotagged. All the photos are geotagged. So there's coordinates attached to that photo. So when you upload it to iNaturalist, it'll drop like a little point where that plant was and then it goes online and then all these botanists or just naturalists in the area will identify it for you if your pictures are good enough. And then you can find out what it is that way. Or you can just use iNaturalist and do kind of what grows around in your area and they'll pop up all the plants and you can filter by plants, you can filter by mushrooms, you can filter by insects. So pretty much anything you're interested in, there's like a bunch of people out there that will identify whatever it is for you. There's mushroom experts on there. There's plant experts on there, insect experts. There's even like microbe experts. You can upload photos of like microbes under a microscope and there'll be people out there that will identify them for you. And then you can learn them once you know the name and you kind of know what they look like. So that's a really, really good resource. That's the one I would recommend and I use it immensely. There's also Calflora, which is I naturalist on steroids for the plants of California, but obviously that only works in California. But it's got every single plant that grows in the state, and you can search by the area you're in, or you can search by the family or genus. And then there's plenty of books out there, but they're kind of big and heavy to carry around, and they're going to be specific to wherever it is that you are searching for plants or mushrooms. So right. say you're in the Pacific Northwest, you're going to want to get field guide to the plants of the Pacific Northwest. It, it, it really depends on where you are, you know? Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you may need different field guides for different mountains, even to make sure you're, you're capturing yep. the right plant species. You brought up iNaturalist. That's something that keeps getting told to me by different guests that iNaturalist has become really the most useful tool, like for widespread citizen scientist access to examining biodiversity, iNaturalist, sounds like it's one of the most important tools in the toolkit at this point. It's great. It's It works really well. And there's tons of people on there. More and more people every single day begin using it. And you get people that are experts in mushrooms of, say, Southern California or something like that. So if you're in that area and upload something, there'll be like one person that keeps identifying the same thing for you. And then, you know, once they identify it for you, you kind of learn what it looks like. And then you can go out and the next time that you see it, you're like, oh, I remember this. This is that plant. And another really nice thing about it is when you use the desktop version, like you're just on your computer, you can search everything that you've ever seen by, say, I want to look at every plant in the rose family that I've ever taken a picture of. I can just type in rosaceae, the family for rose, and it'll show up every single plant observation that I've ever had that is in the rose family, whether or not I even specified it, because iNaturalist has a big database and it just knows what plant or what fungus is in, what family, subfamily, what tribe. So if you're ever just curious of like, oh, I wonder what's in this plant tribe, and you can just search by that and it'll show up everything that you've seen and you can look at them all and be like, oh, okay. So this tribe has these characteristics that are all pretty similar. It's just a really powerful, really useful tool and you can use it to just look for plants ahead of time where you're going or to look after you went and you're like, oh, I did see that there. I can't recommend it enough. It's, it's a great tool. And we've kind of laid out a lot of different tips to searching for wild plants, whether it be looking for certain rock deposits or certain geological formations to target your search using iNaturalist. And in terms of the basics of plant ID, or are there any rules of thumb when you're looking at a new plant that can help you pick out what family or what species it's in? You know, with mushrooms, obviously there's like gills versus pores, there's veil versus non-veil, but what are some traits you look at in plants to start getting an idea of where that plant falls in terms of identification? Sure. Almost all plants, flowering plants, at least you need the reproductive parts. So the flower. And it's pretty easy, like, oh, okay, this is a flower. And the number of petals are often important, whether the petals are all united into, like, a tube. Think of, like, like a honeysuckle or something like that, where the flower is kind of tube-shaped. That's different than, say, like a rose, where each petal is, you could pluck it off without damaging any of the other petals. 
the size, you know, if it's a shrub, some plants are like all shrubs, some are all herbs, some are annuals, which means that, you know, they grow for a couple of months and then die and just down the number of stamens, the number of pistils, whether the ovary is above or below the petals can be important. Leaves being opposite or alternate can be important. Just like looking at mushrooms and saying, okay, this one has gills or this one doesn't, or this one has a veil that's cobwebby like Cortinarius or it doesn't. Just like that, plants are the same way. You can you start to get a really good idea of what family a thing is in. Like asters, you know, like sunflowers and daisies, yeah. they all, pretty much every aster is immediately identifiable as an aster once you kind of see different plants in that family. You can walk around, you can go anywhere in the world. You can be in Australia and walk up to a plant you've never seen before and be like, that's an aster. That's definitely an aster. And after looking at a lot of plants for a while, you can get to kind of more obscure genera and be like, okay, this is definitely in the milkweed family because it has these same shaped flowers and pollen sacs and little dangling U shape. That's when it gets fun because <laughs> <laughs> I've gone to Thailand and Vietnam and Chile and you can walk around and be like, oh, I know this plant's in this genus, even though I've never seen it. You'd be like, that is crazy. I can't believe that this plant's here. And, you know, it just gets even more exciting. Same as if you were um, studying fungi and you went to, say, like China or something like that. A lot of the mushrooms there are going to be very similar and identifiable to anybody that is familiar with mushrooms. Like, okay, this is a belief. Oh, I think it's even in this genus. Plants and fungi have had millions of years to spread around the world. And once you get, like, kind of basic identification knowledge down, you can identify any plant anywhere to family or genus or at least somewhere that gets you closer to actually identifying what it is. Doesn't sound that much different than mushroom foraging, just a different organism to learn the anatomy of and, and get your vocabulary down. Yep. Yeah. It's just like that. Once you got your vocabulary, um, you can be like, all right, these are petals. These are sepals. This leaf is toothed this leaf is entire which means it has no teeth whenever you're learning a bunch of new like scientific names it can seem daunting but once you know them it makes a lot of sense uh, it's pretty clear that you love being out in the field looking for plants in situ hence you being in nevada right now and people can't see this but it looks absolutely gorgeous out there you know you've spent months at a time hiking some of these pacific crest trails and other huge long trails can you give us a little bit about what that experience is like for you when you're out in the wilderness for that long? How has that influenced your own personal development and your relationship with the plants that you love? I think it's completely made me who I am. It's just a life-altering experience the first time you do it. And then you just want to keep doing it. <laughs> I mean, you get to be outside for four months at a time only occasionally coming into town to buy more food and then you hitchhike back into or into the forest and keep on hiking. But the best thing about it is, is just the nonstop 24 seven looking at plants and animals and fungi and just learning and learning and learning. And it gets to a point where like when you see something that you haven't been looking at all day, you're like, okay, that's definitely different. I have not seen that flower before or I've definitely not seen that mushroom before. And so you take a picture of it and then you try and identify it. When I get into town, one of the first things I always do is start looking up, you know, I got service. Oh, what was that? What was that thing I saw back there? And then you try and figure out what that species was. And then you're like, yeah, oh, that's awesome. It's this. And then you remember <laughs> it and then you might see it farther along the trail. So the whole hike, you're just adding like dozens and hundreds of new plants and animals to your your mind, I guess you'd say. You get so familiar with all these plant species. I don't know how to explain it. It's just really fun to be like, all oh, right, I'm in black brush habitat right now. And I know that in that habitat, these plants are often found. And you can kind of predict what's going to be there, even if you've never been there before, just by looking at like the main plants in that area. And then you'd be like, oh, there it is, just like I thought. And just having all, I mean, we would walk on the Appalachian Trail and Pacific Crest Trail 
well, less so on the Appalachian, but the PCT and the CDT, we would go 30, 35 miles a day. So you're hiking for like 15 hours sometimes. <laughs> it's a lot of time to be there with your thoughts and you just kind of think about what you want to do with your life. You think about plants, you think about animals. I listen to audiobooks a lot. It's just the most peaceful thing. Well, we're in a society where we don't really have any space. You know, we don't really have any time to stop and think and reflect. Whenever I hear about people taking these long hikes on trails, it seems like that's this spiritual ritual we almost need in our society. Like, hey, we need to take a time out from the madness and flood of information that we get all the time from the internet. We need to take some time and like disconnect and get out in the natural world and have the kind of experience you're talking about where you're embracing a whole different environment for like months at a time and you're just swallowed by it. And I thought of this word sensory vocabulary when you're talking about getting a feel for the look of all these plants and then suddenly you see something different and you know because you've been exposed to this environment you know, for 15 hours at a time. And it would seem to be a really important part of developing our sensory vocabulary for nature because we can intellectualize it, read it in books, but there's something different about being lost in it. And then you get this real knowing when you've seen it, smelled it, heard it for that long at a time. Uh, it seems like the only modern avenue we have left for any kind of like spiritual journey almost. Now, I don't know if I'm ascribing spirituality to something that, but it just feels that way to me because communing with nature, I talk with a lot of guests about communing with nature, however briefly can be really rejuvenating for mind, body, spirit. But when you're out there for 15 hours a day, months at a time, that feels like it would be a whole cleansing process, leaving you different afterwards than you were when you came in. It sounds like some of that happens for you. Yeah, absolutely. Every single hike I've done has been a life altering experience in, in so many ways. I can't even, you realize you can live with so little because everything that you need to exist is on your back and you're just carrying it with you. After the PCT, the time, the first time I did it, I got home and I got rid of everything that I could. <laughs> I just moved like the year before into North Carolina and I bought a couch and bed and all this furniture and stuff and I was just like I, I don't actually need any of this so it downsized enormously I got super fascinated by plants while I was hiking on that trail especially western plants because I'm from the east coast I know the Appalachian Mountains well but out there I, I just became obsessed with western plants and then I've been studying them ever since like 2014 also like you're out there hiking with friends that you make along the way when I did the PCT the first time, I went all alone. But, you know, there's hundreds of other people out there, but started the trail by myself. And then you meet friends along the way that you just click with, and then you kind of become like a family. You call it a trail family. And then you're just hiking with these people, you know, day in, day out, laughing and giggling and suffering when there's a storm or it's snowing or it's cold or you're being destroyed by mosquitoes. And you just commiserate. It's just a potent experience. Yeah, it's like finding your tribe while you're out there. Yeah. And, and I had a question about that, about the community you develop when you're out on the trail, because I follow a couple people on social media <clears throat> that are really big into, you know, long trail hikes, and it just seems like such a tight-knit community. The people you meet on your trail become your brothers in nature, your brothers and sisters in nature, so it seems like a really powerful experience. I got to say, every time I've ever gone on one of these hikes, um, you get this thing called post-trail depression because <laughs> you're just so amped every day. You hike so far every day. You, your body gets so much exercise. You're flooded with endorphins. And then you come back and then you just sit there and all your friends are gone because, you know, they live in Canada or the other side of the country and they're not with you anymore. And you're used to talking to them every day and just laughing with them. And now you're just alone and you're not exercising and most people get into a slump that they call the post trail depression and then all you can do is think about is hiking the next trail so that's why i keep doing them <laughs> it informs a life where suddenly all you can do is go hike on trails because that's the only thing that's worth it anymore that's the oh, only man. thing that brings joy to your life and it's just such an obvious counterpoint 
to the life a lot of us live, me included, that's mostly indoors, mostly sedentary. You know, I get out during mushroom season, but what you're describing is like a whole other way to live. It seems like it optimizes our human machine, like exercising, being exposed to natural stimuli, not artificial stimuli. The reason I, I'm so into asking questions about it is I really want to go on some long trail hikes. You know, I've climbed Mount Whitney, uh, even, nice. but even hikes like that that are a couple days, hugely powerful. It changes you when you go out in nature for that long. So, you know, when you go out in nature a little bit, definitely hugely therapeutic. But when you go out for those kind of extended periods, you know, that's what I like to call a fat growth period. That's when you can really yeah. change who you are for, for the better. Another thing too, if you can do it completely by yourself without anybody else, that's pretty powerful too. Because on most of my through hikes, I was hiking with, you know, a group of friends, but I've gone and done sections of the Sierra Nevada last year. I did like a, like a three or four day little stint in the Sierra Nevada by myself. And I saw hardly anybody. It's one of the more memorable <laughs> experiences I had all of last year because you kind of, I don't know. You're kind of afraid a little bit, especially at night. You're kind of spooked. Little things spook you, but kind of in a healthy way. Not so bad that you don't want to keep doing it. It's just really, really powerful. And especially to have no one else to talk to and you're just there with your thoughts all day. <laughs> it's therapeutic. It feels great. That combination of solitude and exposure to nature, hugely transformative. What are some mushrooms you find when you're out on the trail? Do you ever come across, you know, dinner when you're out there? You find some shed trails or some porcini or? Yeah. So on the PCT last year, down in the, I think it was the San Bernardino Mountains, I saw a bunch of morels growing around uh, Mount Baden Powell. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't cook anything when I hike. So I didn't have a stove to cook them with. <laughs> so I was pretty sad about that. Normally, I'm like fine with not cooking, but when you see something like these big fatty morels, they look so <laughs> good. And I didn't have any like oil or anything that I could have been, you know, fried them up in. And then up north, when you start getting into Oregon and Washington, we we're going through and there were king bullies, porcinis just popping up. And oh, they were so perfect. And <laughs> some weren't like had no maggots in them at all yet. You just look at them and you kind of like touch the top of their cap and you're just like, you would be so good to eat. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I but, had my stove and oil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm unusual in that way. Most people do carry a stove and cook stuff, but I wasn't going to be like, hey, let me borrow your stove and cook this like wild mushroom, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I nah. swear it's not poisonous. I swear. No, I definitely come across them, especially later in the year in moister areas. Hiking on the Appalachian Trail was just unbelievable with the amount and variety of mushrooms that I saw. That was a place I should have carried. I saw chanterelles everywhere. I saw heresium, you know, lion's mane all over the place once it got cooler out. Bull eats everywhere. It was ridiculous. <laughs> I feel like those trails must have untapped vast amounts of fungi like that because there is much less human disturbance and the fungi are allowed to just thrive in those environments. So another yeah. reason why we all need to get out on these big trails is to have longer exposures to nature, improve ourselves for the better and find tons of fungi. We might not want to follow your advice, Matt. We might want to all bring a stove. If we're going to find these uh, fatty morels and chanterelles, we want to have something to, to cook them with. Separate from the big trail hikes, do you ever go out foraging? I mean, you seem really knowledgeable about fungi. I went into this interview thinking, all right, let me try to get myself together with plants. But obviously, you have a huge knowledge of fungi as well. So do you ever go out foraging, uh, hunting for wild mushrooms? It depends. Last year, I wasn't really in the Pacific Northwest for very long. But the year before that, I went up into Portland area and went foraging with some friends. And we found all kinds of stuff. It was kind of a drier year, but it was still pretty fun. And we did a taste test of a bunch of different mushrooms. We tried one of the grisettes, which I was like kind of sketched out, you know, it's like an amanita. I was like, Oh, I know, right. I know what it is, but still like, I don't know. And so I only ate a little piece. I kind of went out, but it tasted good. Yeah. I mean, I, I try to, I'm just usually in very, very dry areas anymore. So <laughs> there's not really a great mushroom season, but when I go out east, I'm hoping to go this fall 
to maybe like Maine, New Hampshire, Virginia, and it should be prime mushroom season when I start getting out there, when it starts going from summer into fall. Hopefully it'll rain a little bit and I can get some of the, like the wood growing mushrooms like Leteparus and Hen of the Woods and things like that starting to go. Those are the two that came to mind for me, especially the Hen of the Woods. Uh, I'm from the East Coast as well. And now that I'm on the West Coast, we don't have Hen of the Woods out here. And that's like my huh. favorite edible mushroom. You just talked about being out in dry areas most of the time right now. Tell us a little bit about your work uh, that you do now as an ecological surveyor for the Great Basin Institute. What does that mean and what do you do? I'm, I'm working at the Las Vegas office down here for the Great Basin Institute. And we do um, ecological surveys. So we'll go out to a plot that's picked by a computer at random anywhere in Southern Nevada that isn't on private property or on like a military base. And uh, we'll drive out there and we'll hike like several miles. We have to to get to it. And then we'll set up plots and then we'll look around the whole plot, see what plant species grow there, how abundant they are, see if there's pollinators in the area. You kind of get an idea of the biomass that's being produced in that area. It's essentially just to like provide BLM land for ranchers and whoever else to give them an idea of how productive the land is and also just to identify if there's any rare plants there that makes it so you can't come and build a, a road through like this rare population of this plant or something like that. Um, and actually we've only really just started, I started working in February, but as you know, soon after that, everything is shut down. So the day that we were supposed to go into the field for the first time, we got closed down. So we oh. actually haven't really started. Uh, but this week we're starting to work again, and then the next couple of weeks we'll be back at it like normal, hopefully. Well, it sounds like that's all in line with your greater ethos of conserving rare plants. So why are you so passionate about that conservation? Maybe even more broadly, why are you so passionate about the conservation of biodiversity? Why is that important, and why should we conserve these things for future generations? I'm just obsessed with it. These plants, you know, have been out here evolving for millions of years, and some of them are just barely surviving at the top of a mountain, say, where, you know, if the planet heats up, you know, over the next couple hundred years, that plant, once it's at the top elevation of this mountain, there's nowhere farther to go if it can't handle the warming temperatures. So that plant will be gone forever. It'll go up there and it'll just poof out and vanish millions and millions of years. Who knows what chemicals were unique to that plant that may have been valuable to people. You never know. Plants are one of the main sources for pharmaceuticals and medicines. And, you know, the more plants we lose, the less things that we have to explore to help us by just helping the plants exist, letting them survive. We're helping safeguard our own species and our own health. You can't protect things that you don't know are out there. So the more you go out into unusual places and search, especially like these great basin ranges in Nevada, which are extremely underexplored, there's dozens of new species in these mountains for sure. And some of these plants may have unique chemicals that people could use. We don't know. Even more so, not just what can this plant do for me, but just have the respect. This plant has evolved here. It's lived here all this time. And if it's our doing that is destroying the plant, I think it's our responsibility to stop it or at least preserve that plant because the amount of time that it takes for something like that to just exist, you can never, ever get it back once it's gone. That's why it was super exciting when me and my girlfriend went and found that Louisia that had only ever been known at one spot. And then we found out it actually grows in quite a few spots. We've just increased our knowledge. This plant is now safeguarded. All these places where that plant is now found are protected or can be protected because that's a critically endangered plant. So the more places that you find where there's super rare plants, you can get protections for those areas and actually preserve more plots of land, different habitats. You can say, okay, maybe this should be considered a reserve because all of these rare plants grow here for some reason. Biodiversity is just one of my favorite things. The more things there are to look at, the more interesting life is. With each plant, you know, that plant had a pollinator, that plant had mycorrhizal fungi, that plant had bacteria, all these things that interacted with it. Once that plant is extinct, 
probably everything that went with it is going to go extinct too, if they were specific to that plant. By preserving plant species, you're preserving everything else because plants are the main part of an ecosystem. Without plants, you don't have anything. You don't have fungi, you don't have animals, you don't have insects. So when you protect plants, you're protecting everything else on the landscape. I love the distinction you made between whether or not it's useful for humans and that you're pursuing the protection and conservation of these plants for biodiversity's sake itself. It, it doesn't have to be something that's immediately useful to us. Biodiversity in and of itself is just incredibly valuable. And I think that humans at our best are stewards of this environment we've been blessed to live within. It's kind of our duty to protect these plants for the plant's sake. You know, that plant deserves to live. That environment deserves to thrive. And it just feels to me like that's part of why we're here. Everyone's searching for a meaning of why humans are here. That's part of the reason we're here is to help be stewards and cultivators of all of these different life forms. And I just love that you made that distinction. And I was hoping you distill that message of, of biodiversity down and you did it wonderfully. Now, how can we help? You know, how can the person listening help in this conservation effort? One of the things that I think is really fun that you can do to help is just go to places where people haven't been or places that are very underexplored. So you can look on, say, iNaturalist, you know, a different mountain range, say somewhere in California or Nevada, where there's no records or very few records. And just go there and just take pictures of everything. Look for any mushroom. Like, oh, that's a strange beetle. Take a picture of that beetle. Just go out where people haven't explored. There's tons of underexplored places in the United States. It seems crazy, but there, there's so many undiscovered plant species, hundreds and hundreds of plant species in the United States that still have no name. People have no idea that they exist. And you can go out there and you can be the ones that find them. And that makes it exciting because you never know what you're going to find. Every time I go out somewhere looking for plants, I see something I've never seen before. Typically, it just turns out to be a plant I've never seen before. But every now and then, it's a plant that I'm like, okay, I don't know what this is. And I'll send it to an expert in that genus, say, and they'll go, yeah, I, I don't know what that is either. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, it very well might be a new species. It's just exciting that there is still things to be found right here in the United States, you know. Not even mentioning, say, like <laughs> the Amazon rainforest or somewhere right. even more remote. The amount of plants and animals still out there is mind-boggling. And it's, it's important that we know that they exist because you can't preserve things that you, you're not even aware of. If you're like, okay, this is a rare plant. It only grows here. Um, you can get protections for that plant and save that habitat. The more biodiversity that you save, you're doing humanity a favor at the same time because everything is interwoven. And once you start unraveling an ecosystem, you know, this plant goes extinct. And with that, this insect goes extinct. And mice really liked eating that insect. And then, you know, turkeys ate that mouse or whatever, you know. It eventually comes around and affects humanity, maybe not directly, but indirectly, every time we lose something. I'm a big believer that, like you're saying, you don't, you can't protect something if you don't know about it. And you don't want to protect something if you don't have a relationship with it. So the more people that go out and just get interested and start documenting their finds, hunting for plants and mushrooms, the more voices we have for those organisms to help make sure they are defended. Because once you have a relationship with it, you care about conserving it. And eventually you're going to be like Matt and be taken over by plants and start going out and surveying and make sure they're, they're protected. But we need more people like that. We need more people on that train. Just a really inspiring way to... to look at the world and another really neat thing on that same point is say you are just out looking for mushrooms or something like that and you do find a rare plant and you post it say to iNaturalist and someone's like wow that's great that's a new occurrence you may have just protected this new area because anywhere where there's a rare plant you have to go through all of these hoops and stuff to do development so anybody can make a difference when you find a new occurrence of a rare plant or a rare mushroom, or a rare animal, anything like that. You know, once there's a GPS point for that, it's a legitimate point if it's identified correctly. 
then that area is no longer able to be bulldozed. People have to take precautions to either go around it or they just won't develop that area ever because it it just isn't worth it economically anymore. So it's crazy. You can take a photo of of a plant you just see somewhere and you might actually make a real difference in the future. Yeah, our observations as naturalists and people who want to get outdoors can actually be really powerful and really important. And I think that's an amazing message for people. Well, we know about your current work then, doing your ecological surveys. Hopefully those get started again soon. Uh, Your work in helping promote this idea of conservation of biodiversity and rare plants. Are there any future plans that we should know about? Do you have any anything else going on that we should know about? At this point, everything's kind of all up in the air, depending on how much money I can make this year. I had wanted to go maybe to another country this winter, and that all depends if you know I make enough money to do that. I'm really waiting for Death Valley to open back up. I'm going to try and spend a lot of my time there. That's one of my favorite places to look for plants and animals, and it's so underexplored. It's amazing how easy it is to find a mountain range in California. California, even, let alone other Western states, that there's just no records of any plants, animals, or anything. You can just walk up, up these mountains and you can be the first ones to document stuff. So I'm really excited for Death Valley to open back up. But other than that, I'll probably just be looking around the eastern Sierra slash southern Nevada, kind of where that all intersect until things start opening up and I can really be moving around a lot more. So that great work of documenting biodiversity to enable future conservation. That's probably the work that is never going to end, a multi-generational work to say the least. And you just mentioned Death Valley is an underexplored area. Are some of the most underexplored areas out in the Western United States? Are there any other areas in particular that stand out to you as like, wow, that's underexplored and has huge potential for for plant, animal, and fungi species? Um, There's actually a lot of places in California, the Modoc Plateau, which is in like the far northeastern uh, part of California has some pretty interesting things, and I don't think it's been explored too well there. It's kind of on the verge of high desert and sort of alpine habitat at the high mountains there. I got to imagine parts of Canada are just completely underexplored. There's mountain ranges there, big limestone mountain ranges that I just I fantasize about getting to <laughs> but it's just it's just so hard to get to them and that's why nobody's been in there but when you go to places that are hard to get to that's where plants that have never been seen are you know just giving everyone their marching orders and they're thinking of new places to hike or new places to explore come on citizen scientists let's get some of these underexplored areas mapped out uh, and is there anything else you want to mention any other topics any other mind blowing facts about certain plants or certain plant fungi insect relationships like that beetle anything else you want to leave us with i guess a a really interesting thing is you got to think of plant distributions in kind of a deep history perspective because all these mountain ranges out here and in california plants that you find now at the very tops of the mountains during the ice age you know just you know 10,000 20,000 years ago they all existed, the same species, but at really, really low elevations. So whenever you go to an area where there's mountain ranges, you can find plants that were picked by rodents, pack rats, that have like put them in caves. And you can go into these little caves and stuff, and you'll see these huge, nasty piles of, uh, you know, it's poop and pee all mixed together, and it hardens into this gross substance. But you can find things like bristlecone pine needles and stuff growing at like 5,000 feet in elevation. And you can carbon date these nests. And some of them are over 50,000 years old. It's about the limit of carbon dating. But you can see that plants, as you know, climates change, they just go up and down in elevation where they can. And they go up and down in latitude where they can. So nothing's in the same place for very long. These ecosystems are all always fluxing. It just seems like they're steady just because humans don't live very long. But over thousands of years, the ranges of plants are going up and down and all over the place. So when you think about that, you can kind of target areas where you think a plant during the Ice Age may have been able to get to. And that's often north-facing slopes. So 
you, you think about like deep time when you're looking for places to look for weird, unusual plants. And it's just really satisfying to do. And then like you go up there and you'll find a plant that is now found like 300 miles north in Oregon or something like that. Oh, it's just so satisfying. And you're looking back in time. We often talk about getting yourself in the viewpoint of a mushroom to understand its habitat and where it wants to live. And it sounds like you're doing the same thing with plants and understand how adaptive and dynamic these plant populations really are. Thank you for for dropping that on us or giving us that perspective. I will move to a couple of our final thoughts that I like to ask everybody. I guess I'm going to ask this as a two-parter for you. Usually I ask people a mushroom they love and why we should know about it. So I'll ask you that same question. What is a mushroom that you love and why should we know about it? And then my second parter will be the same question for a plant, a plant you love and why we should know about it. So I'll start with uh, the fungus first. There's a fungus that infects cicadas called Mesospora and it takes over the body of cicadas. And there's a couple different species. There's one that infects the periodical cicadas that occur in the Eastern United States, the ones that come out every 17 or 13 years, depending on the brood. And then there's one that kind of occurs in the Southwestern United States called Mesospora platypedia. And that infects a cicada called the wingbanger cicada. And these fungi, they kill the cicada over time, but they infect the cicadas once they emerge as adults. And they start producing all these weird chemicals and it's really interesting, Mesospora platypedia produces psilocybin. And it's thought that the mushroom or the fungus is affecting the cicada's behavior with the psilocybin, not too unlike it would affect a human. It does something to their nervous system and it makes them behave differently. They'll often just start mating with any other cicada nearby, male or female. They have no preference anymore. They just walk <laughs> around and that means um, they spread the spores to as many cicadas as possible. So this fungus is hijacking the cicada's behavior to help spread itself. And the fungus, it makes the butt of the cicada fall off. And there's just this big, massive plug of spores just exposed. And the cicada just walks around like there's nothing wrong with it at all, trying to mate with all the other cicadas and just tapping their butts together and put spores on each other. And it's just really crazy to think that you know, insects get affected by psychogenic chemicals just like mammals do. And it uses it against the cicada's own will, makes it, you know, help spread the fungus. That's insane. Wow. Thank you for, for sharing that one. I had never heard of that. And that is like cordyceps on the next level, like taking over the insect's brain and making it trip out and try to have sex with everything and spread its spores around <laughs> that is wild yeah it, it's super cool the cicadas that were used in the study that found that out i collected during the continental divide trail hike i just caught them and i was like i knew my advisor was interested in mesospora and i was like hey i've got these cicadas i found and he's like oh yeah mail them to me so i overnight shipped them to him and then he did all these like studies on them and man they just found out so many interesting things about it so it was just cool to be like it was amazing to be like a tiny little part of it just yeah on the exploring side like that's what i want to do i want to find things and then other people can research them hardcore (laughs) (laughs) it's just amazing that like that like that was completely unknown there's just secrets hidden everywhere in nature and we're you know just starting to find more and more things out yeah we just need more and more people out in the woods And then what is the plant that we should know about and why? And that's going to be a pretty hard act to follow. Oh, man. I guess I'll pick sort of a group of related species called Claytonia. Same genus as miner's lettuce, common plant, you know, this forage out west tastes pretty good. But this one has a small little tuber under the ground and it only has two leaves typically. It's a plant that is kind of radiated into a bunch of different species, kind of in Southern California and the Great Basin. They just grow in super, super isolated populations. For example, there's one here, Claytonia panamentensis, that grows in the spring mountains. And then the same species is found over in Death Valley, about 100 miles away, only in the Panamints. So there's kind of a really weird disjunction there. And you just got to think how on earth did seeds from Claytonia panamentensis get 
from the Panamint range to the Spring Mountain range or vice versa? Right. Or was it once abundant everywhere during the Ice Age when that plant could grow at lower elevations? And then, you know, these are the two relic populations that now remain. Plants like that tell a story because they're there. They got there somehow, whether a bird happened to fly 100 miles, you know, with undigested seeds in his stomach and then crapped them out, you know, on a different mountain range. It was just the right spot and they started growing. Things like that, like plant distributions just blow my mind. How how did it get that way? There's a story. I found a couple this year and it was super exciting. You know, I screamed in the air and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, as one does. And that is really interesting to think about how plant and fungi distributions do tell a story, tell about a history that we haven't mapped out yet. And sometimes that's the only perspective we get on it is seeing these distributions, these distributions of organisms. And that's the only hint we get about some way that two land masses may have been related, or it's really a fascinating topic, just, just being able to study time like that. Now, what would you tell to an 18 year old, Matt? What would be your advice given the knowledge you have now? What would be your advice to an 18 year old you? Oh man, start studying plants sooner. <laughs> I mean, I was always interested in plants, but I didn't get really hardcore interested in them until maybe 2014 when I was 24. I just kind of, you know, knew the common names of the plants around me. And then once I came out West, I just, oh, I became obsessed. And that's when you start buying like keys and books, you know, so you can key plants out. And the more time that goes by, the more plants you learn, the more mushrooms you learn. Just would have been nice to have a six year head start, I guess. <laughs> yeah. There's always that question of if, you tell yourself something at 18 years old, would it change where I'm at now? And I like where I'm at now. But I often, yeah, think, exactly. I, I often think the same thing about mushroom hunting. It's like, man, if I could have started this at like three years old, that would have been fantastic. <laughs> so maybe the earlier yeah. the earlier okay. you start looking at these organisms, the more you start bud studying biodiversity, the, the better, the earlier you go. Um, and then this is another massive question. What is the lasting impact that you hope to make with your work in plant conservation and exploring biodiversity in underexplored areas? What is the lasting impact you hope to make with that work? Oh, I really hope to have just an unbelievable multitude of plant observations that people can go to decades from now and be like, wow, he really did see this plant here. For example, when I'm researching plants, Lots of times I'll get the point from somebody, you know, from the 1930s. A lot of people in the Death Valley area were botanizing a lot in the 1930s for some reason. So it's fun to go to this person's point where they said that they saw this plant 70, 80 years before you went there. And then sure enough, it's right there. They were right. They found it. And it's just amazing. They're like, you know, even after you're long dead and gone, all of this information that you collected is still useful and viable. So I'm just hoping to go around and find a lot of plant points and help other people get to them. Like, I love it when people are like, oh, this is a really cool plant. Can you show me where that is? And I usually won't tell them exactly where it is just to protect it because you don't you know strangers on the internet. You don't want them collecting it or selling them online or, you know, things like that. But I'll give them a hint on how to find it. And another thing I really want to do someday is to hopefully uh, describe a new plant species that's part of the goal. You know, that's one of the driving forces to find something new. You know, they're out there, you know, there's new plants all over the place and you just got to get to that spot where no one's ever been before or nobody paid attention to plants when they were there. And then be like, that looks, looks interesting. And then you show it to the experts in that genus and hopefully maybe you can find something new. I mean, that's a worthy legacy of a lifetime of exploring and, observations and cataloging your finds that record is the legacy itself that continues on for generations and generations and who knows what people are going to glean from that massive amount of data that you've been able to contribute that is indeed a worthy legacy well matt thank you so much for taking the time you know while you're out in the field taking the time out to speak with us teach me about plants, teach listeners about plants, drop some amazing information about mushrooms and fungi while you were at it. Thank you for, for being a part of the Mushroom Hour. Thanks so much. It's been awesome. I can talk about plants forever. <laughs>